Let's throw in a speedrun game. We are 827. And I remind those of you watching on YouTube that the sort of point of the speedrun is to emphasize openings. I will be playing exclusively my recommended repertoire. Obviously, when we climb a little bit higher, we will be focused more on developing opening theory. And this is just sort of the, the companion speedrun to my official opening recommendations. Okay, this time we're wide against Alon Art KK. Let's go one to E4. Uh, for those watching on YouTube, the reason my rating is now 911, I just want a three move game where our opponent abandoned. All right, let's go. I'd have three. Well, actually, I mean, <laughs> my like official recommendation is the Vienna. Um, but I basically have two, like there's two openings that I recommend for you to learn uh, against D4E5. There's the Vienna. And as you guys know from the previous speed run, the Four Nights Scotch, which sounds like a really boring opening. But if you watch the previous speed run carefully, you will know that it's an incredibly dangerous weapon at every level under 2000 and even over 2000 it's a totally legitimate line it just has this reputation as you know one of those like oh it's just like a four nights you know you're just like you know the most mundane development but it, it it's won us a lot of quick games 94 what the heck is this yeah this is this is a kind of move that is intended to scare you know, scare a beginner. Oh, knight is moving into the center. But if you just look at it carefully, you will see uh, that it just blunders upon it. I mean, I don't, I'm not familiar with this move. Maybe this is some sort of trick gambit, but I don't buy it. So, you know, what's funny is that if you were afraid to take the pawn on e5, right, you could also just keep developing with bishop c4. Like, you don't have to react to this knight on d4 at all. But obviously here, like, we just take the pawn on e5. Like, that, there's nothing to calculate here. And there's nothing to calculate because black has nothing developed. So, so if you think logically, like there cannot be a trick when your opponent has like one developed piece. That's not the way the chess works. Knight f6. But we're not satisfied just winning the pawn. The the sort sort of Soviet schoolboy approach here would be to drop the knight back to f3 and smoke the knight out of d4. But I think, well, I think we can play a lot more opportunistically. Um, I think we can play a lot more opportunistically if we wanted to with bishop c4. The funny thing is that after bishop c4, there is a move which quite concerns me, believe it or not. After bishop c4, there's this weird move, queen d8 to e7. And you might look at this and say, I don't get that move at all. Like, you know, we could just take on f7. But as I'll show you guys after the game, uh, I think we've transposed to a weird trick line where white is in fact much better, but there's quite a bit of theory there. So I think much safer and much more prudent is just to say, hey, this knight on e5 is quite vulnerable, right? Why is it vulnerable? Isn't, he, isn't it in the center? Isn't that a good thing? Well, just a piece being in the center, I've explained this before, does not necessarily make it good, right? The knight on e5 lacks, lacks an anchor and it's vulnerable to attack by several different pieces. Queen to e7 is the main threat. Because not only will it chase the knight back, it would then allow black to recapture the pawn on e4. So the simplest way to play is just to double back to f3. And this kills two birds with one stone, because not only do we move the knight, we also contest the knight on d4, which our opponent just immediately blunders in one move. Knight takes d4. Thank you very much for the minor piece. And the game is already over. <laughs> so... And now I know the YouTube comments are going to be like, okay, you know, why is it that when you play, you know, you, you're playing these people who just like bunter pieces on every move, but, but it's, it's, I think a large part of it is because of the, our choice of openings. Okay. D takes C4. Let's focus on converting this advantage clinically. Okay. So in this position, I think a lot of people at the, uh, at a beginner level would be very tempted would be very tempted by the move bishop f1 to b5 check. Let's develop a, our bishop with tempo. That is not a good move. Why is bishop b5 check not a good move? And if you're watching on, on YouTube, you know, make sure that you're answering along with the chat. c6, yeah. Bishop b5 allows c6. 
And then in that position, you might say, I see a tactic. There's knight d4 takes c6. But after bc, bishop takes c6 check, black brings the bishop out to d7. You take the rook in the corner, and black recaptures the bishop. And what you have then is an extra exchange and two pawns. White is still winning, but there's absolutely no need to give away two of your minor pieces. Much simpler is just to drop this knight back to b3. And the reason I'm dropping it back to b3 is because of process of elimination. It's not that this is such a nice square. I don't want to bring it up to b5 because that just walks right into a6. I definitely don't want to bring it back to e2 because it blocks the development of the bishop. And right now, the most important thing for us is to develop our pieces rapidly and actively. Okay, c5. This move accomplishes exactly nothing. It doesn't threaten anything because the c4 square is protected by our light squared bishop. And here, of course, there are multiple ways that we could proceed with our development. Our, I think, top priorities here, of course, are to complete the development of our king side, number one. But number two, this pawn on e4 is very annoying. Yeah, it, It's hanging over our position. It's making it a little bit hard for us to breathe. So what move comes immediately to mind? Yeah, I think we should just play the move d3. Let, let's get rid of that pawn on e4 in order to make it easier for us to coordinate our minor pieces. And also the move d3 is good from a developmental standpoint because it opens up the dark squared bishop, which we could later deploy, for example, to g5. Okay? So you might say, but we're not developing a piece. Well, the thing is, we don't really need to be developing a piece on every move. We're perfectly safe here. Queen e7. Okay. So again, there's like a million ways that we could play here. But anytime I see the alignment of the queen and the king, that is usually a liability rather than a, uh, a, a what's the opposite of liability? <laughs> it's liability rather than a strength, I guess. And it's a liability for two reasons. The first is that if you just look at Black's king on e8, asset, asset, thank you. Yeah, it's a liability rather than an asset. That's the word I was looking for. That king on e8 is totally out of squares. Well, you might say it's not out of squares, but if the white queen controls the d-file, the black king is out of squares. Couple that with the fact that black has already advanced c5. What does that tell me? Well, that tells me that if we deliver a check on b5 with the, with the bishop, black is no longer going to have the move c6. So what move am I heavily implying that we should play? Right? We need to be able to control the d-file. We want to create the threat of a devastating check on b5, potentially. Yeah, just e takes e4. I think a lot of people would be afraid of knight takes e4. Ooh, black sets up a discovery. But all of that is a total paper tiger. Even if we didn't have bishop b5 check, which wins on the spot, after knight takes e4, at the very least, we could just take the knight and then block with our queen and force a queen trade. Right? Bishop f5. Okay, well, that's... Probably a better move, actually, than knight takes e4. But it doesn't change our approach. Obviously, the bishop is untouchable because the black queen pins the e4 pawn. But the simplest, of course, is just to play bishop to b5 check. We continue our development with tempo. Yeah, bishop b5 is very natural. And then we can just castle. And then we can just castle. Um, again, something that I repeat every time we're early on in the speed run, which is that when you're up a piece like this, th there's usually going to be like four or five moves in every position that are approximately equivalent in strength. So you might be looking at this and saying, well, hey, I like the move F3. Why didn't he play the move F3 to defend the E4 pawn? Well, F3 is a perfectly reasonable working man's move. Nothing wrong with a move F3. I just think bishop E5 is a little bit more to the point. Okay, bishop d7. Well, I think we should just trade. I think we should just trade. Let's get that bishop off the board. And we are also trying to force black to recapture with the knight, which is going to give us this incredibly beautiful stronghold on d5 for our knight, right? Okay. And we don't need to play f3. Our pawn on e4 is perfectly well protected. Okay, queen takes d7. And without even thinking twice... Without even thinking twice, we trade queens. But just because we've traded queens does not mean that it is time to abandon basic principles, right? We have not completed our development. 
So let's focus on doing that. Now, I'm thinking here that rather than castling kingside, I think it's a better idea for us to try to castle queenside, right? There's no longer any risk associated with castling queenside. And the benefit of castling queenside is that we simultaneously bring our rook onto uh, a very juicy open file. Now, what needs to happen in order for us to cast queenside? Well, we need to get this bishop out. Well, where should we put this bishop? You might say, well, let's put it on, no, not h6. Let's put it on g5 because that's the most active square. It's not the most active square. Bishop g5 just walks right into f6 or h6. So the, the next best thing is just to play bishop c1 to f4. This bishop is invulnerable on f4. It's also controlling the d6 square, making it harder for black to develop his bishop Okay, c4, whatever. Now, anytime a pawn is pushed, a square is going to be opened up, right? You should get into the habit, even as a beginner, of always asking yourself when a pawn is pushed, what squares are now available to your pieces? And applying this logic directly, you can see that you have this juicy, nice square in the center for your knight that has just been opened up. And if black plays bishop f8 to c5, then we can still castle queenside because the rook is going to be protecting the knight. Right? Simple moves. Of course, knight a5 is also good. Yeah, the more advanced players are going to see the move knight b3 to a5, forking the b7 and c4 pawns. But knight d4 is even simpler. And right now we're focused on keeping it simple. Castles queenside, defending the knight with our rook. Defending the knight with our rook. We don't need even to attack any more pawns. We don't really need to seek out any further material. What we need to do here is bring all of our pieces into the game, and eventually we're going to crash through down the d-file. Okay, so I, I mentioned this phrase, crash through down the d-file. What does that really mean? Well, what that really means is we're going to pile up our rooks on the d-file, we're going to move the knight away from d4, and we're going to orchestrate a bunch of trades on the d-file that's going to make the win a lot easier. So how are we going to do that? Well, to, for starters, I like to move rook to d2, preparing to double rooks on the d-file. We don't need to move this knight just yet. We can just keep it on d4. Now, hopefully, as you're watching this, my strategy is making sense. You should be sort of saying, I can see why he's doing what he's doing, even if you would have chosen a slightly different method in your own conversion, right? You can, you can convert the way that you feel. There's different styles of converting a big advantage like this. But the goal is for this to be making, you know, easy logical sense. Knight f6. Does this create any threats? No, it does not, because the e4 pawn for the moment is defended by our knight. We can continue with our plan, completing the doubling of the rooks. And of course, if black plays the move rook f to e8, then I think would be a perfect opportunity for us to play f3. Yeah, let's play f3 uh, to protect the e4 pawn once and for all so that we don't have to worry about knight takes e4. Everything is solid. Everything is safe. And on the next move, we are going to move this knight off of d4, opening up the d file for the rooks. And for example, after you play the move knight to f5, which is the ideal square for the knight, you might notice, okay, knight h5, never mind. Forget it. Um, That's a good move, actually. That, that is a good move. It, it harasses it harasses the bishop on f4, but the bishop has, of course, the nice little e3 square. Let's see if our opponent finds the move f5. I'll be very impressed if he finds f5. I'll be very impressed if he finds f5. Because that's a super advanced move. Okay, b5. Yeah, b5 is, is, not, is not effective. Uh, it's not effective because it simply blunders the pawn. Obviously, we don't want to take with this knight because that would plunder the bishop with a pin. But if we wanted to really stick to our strategy, we could also play the move knight to f5 here. We don't even really need uh, to take any further pawns. And in fact, I'm going to show you guys how effective this strategy can be. Let's just go knight f5 here. I don't care about this additional pawn. We are already up a piece in a pawn. And as I've mentioned in previous speedruns, there is the sort of law of diminishing returns of material. The more extra material you have, the less meaningful additional pawns and additional material becomes. So right, if you're up a pawn, winning a second pawn is massive. That's a game changer. 
if you're up a, a piece, then winning a second piece often doesn't actually change the evaluation because you're winning to begin with. Okay, g6 is 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 um, uh, accelerates the the defeat. We can just play bishop takes bishop, simultaneously attacking the rook on f8, and that the game is over. And the game is over. Game is over. Yeah, I think it's likely that our opponent will resign here. Yeah, a simple a simple game that was made anticlimactic by the fact that our opponent blundered a piece in the opening. We take the rook on f8. Okay, but but I would caution you against saying this was not a worthy opponent. Everybody, um, you were once at this level too, so the last thing we want is to make people feel embarrassed that they are just starting to play. The whole point of the speedrun is to give everybody something to learn from wherever they are in their chess journey. What should we do now? Again, how do we, if we want to stick to our strategy of like maximum simplification, what should we do? Yeah, just rook d8. Just rook d8, trade the rooks, right? It's gonna be so much easier once the rooks are off the board. Yeah, this is over, rook d8, just trade. Now you might say, well, why didn't we take the pawn? Of course, taking the pawn is also fine, but I'm just trying to illustrate this idea that trading and simplifying, it really often is the simplest way to win these positions. Okay, now we can do a billion, a, a billion different things, but I think the simplest is just to play the move g2 to g3, chasing the knight off of f4. Uh, obviously, the, the pawn was hanging, so just defending with tempo. That's all we're doing, chasing the knight away. Notice that yeah, I was about to say e2 is protected, literally, and of course our opponent puts the knight there. And now it's really easy, fe, fe. And to win such a position in the in the quickest possible way, yeah, the, the easiest is just to use your extra material to win a bunch of pawns and then make a bunch of queens. Like rather than trying to checkmate with the rook and the knight, use the rook to win like a pawn and create a pass pawn. Basically, just make a queen. And the simplest way to do that is, of course, to go after the a6 pawn. And the way to do that is by rook play playing rook d6. And rook d6, we're going to go after this pawn. Then we're going to create a passer. Let's drop it back to d5, skewering the pawns here. Sounds very pedantic that I'm talking about what to do here. But if you really want to improve, you should try to convert every aspect of the game into a learning experience, which you can do. Okay, now, of course, we can try to win both of these pawns. Let's go rook, rook before, rook a5, doesn't matter. Okay, whatever, just, I mean, you can take with a pawn, you can take with a knight. We'll take with a pawn because that already creates a passed pawn. And now, one last teachable moment, folks. Um, the easiest way here is to play the move rook to d4 to cut off the black king. And when I say this word cut off, what that means is you occupy a file. And obviously the king, without the assistance of any other pieces, is unable to cross that file. And this is very effective if you're trying to promote a pawn, because now you can close your eyes and you can just push the c-pawn forward. And notice that the knight is also defending the rook, so the king is utterly helpless. Now, if you're a beginner, you would never want to pre-move in such a position. You want to Spend at least a couple of seconds per move to make sure that you're not stalemating your opponent. And now the simplest is ladder checkmate. So the king has one escape square, which is g6. So let's drop our queen back to f5 to cover that escape square and pave the way for a check on d7, which is going to drive the king back to the eighth rank, which is precisely the fastest way to checkmate, always to drive the king onto the bottom rank. Queen defends the rook, and easy clap, check, king f8, and mate on f7. We didn't even use our knight. Good stuff. Okay, that was an easy, simple game. And buckle in, because a lot of the games that we play, like probably the next 10, 15 games, are going to be pretty straightforward and, and will probably be decided by like one move blunders, but that's okay. That doesn't mean you can't learn from them. So again, here we can see here we can see the fact that a lot of these games are just decided by poor opening play. This blunders the pawn on e5. But since this speedrun 
has an emphasis on the opening. Let's talk a little bit about why I rejected the move bishop to c4. So what's interesting about this move is that I actually am familiar with the line that goes bishop c4. Now, there is the move knight d4. This move does exist. It's not a good move, but it exists. And after knight takes c5, the point is to play the move queen e7. And surprisingly, things actually get quite tricky here. Be because if you play knight takes f7, black has a very nasty little move here. And it's not knight takes e4. Who can tell me why knight takes e4 loses on the spot? What should white do in this position? White is a move after which black can virtually resign. What is it? Now, it might seem that black has all sorts of threats on the e file. Yeah, just get out of there. Castles. Just castle king side. Yeah, just get out of there. And that's it. I mean, look at Black's position. The rook is hanging. The e-file is... Black is just going to get massacred down the e-file. And if Black plays knight c3, then you simultaneously recapture and attack the knight. Black simply cannot keep everything protected at the same time. If rook g8, then the simplest is just knight takes e4. Again, alignment of queen and king. Always watch for that in the opening. And that's it. So instead... Black has this move, d5, yes. And this intercepts the bishop and the knight. So if you play knight takes d5, black can actually grab the knight on f7, and you don't have any effective discoveries. Knight takes c7, queen takes c7. If knight takes f6, queen takes f6. So when you're calculating a discovered check or a discovered attack, make sure that the piece you're trying to win cannot itself recapture uh and get out of the discovered attack, right? This is a classic scenario. Yeah, you can play the move knight b6 here, but but don't miss the forest for the trees. White's king is now all alone on e1. Black can slide the queen up to g6. And the rook on a8 is the least significant of all of the pieces on the board. Black plays queen takes g2, and this is actually a pretty famous type of trick. If you go rook f1, queen takes e4 leads to checkmate. Bishop b2, knight f3. Those of you who've watched like your share of Eric Rosen videos will know that this is actually a classic pattern in the Italian. And of course, the most famous instantiation of this is the Blackburn Gambit, bishop c4, and again, this move, knight d4. And I have seen a gazillion scholastic games that go knight takes f7, queen takes g2, rook f1, takes bishop b2, and knight f3 checkmate. Super famous. This is the sh not the yeah the Blackburn shilling gambit. Yeah, of course this is totally on sound. And here White can just play knight takes d4 castles and get a big advantage. This pawn is terrible, but it's a good opening for 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 a couple of lulls. So after knight e5, knight f6, bishop c4, queen e7, knight f7. We were considering the move d5. Now you might say, well, I can just take the rook in the corner, but after dc you get a classic scenario where black has already won one minor piece and black is most probably going to win the knight on h8 because it is no way back. Uh, white is still better here, but it's very complicated. And this is totally contrary to what we're trying to illustrate in the speedrun. I'm trying to play simple chess, at least for the first like 15, 20 games. And finally, if you play the move bishop takes f7 check, then after king d8, white is in trouble. Why is white in trouble? Because the knight is hanging. Why is that a problem? Well, if the knight moves, then the bishop's going to be hanging. Classic scenario, the queen attacks both pieces. And if you play f4 to support the knight, then black chases the knight away with a pawn, and white actually loses a piece here and loses the game. So for this reason, we just dropped our knight back to f3. It's simple, it's strong, and it's easy to calculate. And obviously, this just blunders a piece in one move. If I were playing black, I would probably go bishop to c5 here, trying to trade on my own terms. Remember that concept, which basically means very often when you have a situation like this, people just assume either you have to trade or you have to decline the trade by moving your piece back. But there is a third option. You can say, hey, I'm willing to trade, but you're going to have to give me something in return, right? In this case, black just simultaneously develops a piece. What's interesting is that the top engine move here is actually this incredibly strange move, knight c3 to e2, trying to smoke the knight out of d4. But I think the simplest is bishop e2. Just develop your pieces, castles, castles. And obviously, black has virtually no 
compensation for the pawn. I mean, these pieces are active, but they are not uh, going to give black full compensation. After rook e8, you can just play d3 and then bishop e3, and eventually you're going to get this knight out of d4. It's not going to stay here forever, right? It's not going to stay here forever. And maybe black can try d5, get some counterplay going, but still, this is this is a pawn down position. And d5, probably you can play bishop g5, and black is still in trouble here. Okay, so this would have been the best way to garner defensive chances. Instead, black blunders a piece in one move. Now, once again, remember that the check on this diagonal is often overrated by beginners. You should never forget about the fact that a pawn can block the check simultaneously attacking the bishop. You should also not forget that in this situation, the best way for white to salvage the situation is knight takes c6. Common idea. bc, bishop c6, fork. But black gets the bishop out in order to be able to recapture. And still, you should not go for this if you can keep your extra piece. Here, you're quote-unquote only up an exchange, and you've also given up a pretty important light squared bishop. So black has like this idea. Things can kind of get complicated here, right? Your, your pieces are also very undeveloped. So although white is winning, this complicates the winning process by a lot. Does that make sense? So for this reason, we are not afraid to make retreating moves knight b3. Now we identify the main obstacle to healthy development, which in this case is this e4 pawn, which is kind of hanging over our position and controlling important squares. So we take it off the board. We play the move d3. And remember, you should never be afraid of a move like bishop g4 because you can just block with bishop b2. Do not fear one move itis, right? Moves that carry threats aren't always dangerous. Queen e7, d takes e4. And... If black had taken with the knight, we would have thrown in a check on b5 and won a second piece. Because after bishop d7, the queen is what's called overloaded. And here, just play queen, queen takes d7 check, bishop takes d7, and at the end, the knight is now undefended. You can play knight takes e4. I guess black can win the second <laughs> win the piece back with rook e8, but still, obviously, uh, one, one extra piece is, is more than enough. Okay, so... For this reason, our opponent played bishop f5. We still played bishop b5 check. We traded the bishops. We traded the queens. We got our bishop out. We brought our knight into the center. We doubled rooks on the main open file. We reinforced the e4 pawn. We orchestrated a trade of bishops. And obviously, uh, our opponent made things a lot easier for us by committing a further blunder. Just last thing, folks. Uh, this move f5 would have been, relatively speaking, better. Who can explain to me what the point is? Like, what if white just plays knight d4 takes f5? This is a good pattern to keep in mind if you want to generate chances. Good pattern to keep in mind. Yeah, rook takes f5. Rook takes f5, and suddenly white is, uh, has lost the extra piece back. Because if you take the rook, then bishop takes e3 pins the, the rook and wins the exchange back. And if bishop takes e5, then rook the same rook that was hanging also recaptures the bishop, right? Rook takes e back. White is still completely winning here, by the way. White is still completely winning here. I mean, you're dominating and you're up two pawns. But there is no point in allowing this. Uh, and, and the best move for white is actually just to move the bishop back to a defended square. A common idea and something you should file away in your mental Rolodex. You move a piece away from an undefended square to a defended square on the same diagonal, right? Bishop e3 to g1 sounds like a typical GM move, but it should make perfect sense to now knight takes f5 is actually a threat. And if black plays fe, then you just recapture with the other knight and look at how nicely the knights are positioned here. Does that make sense? And that's all she wrote, folks. After knight f5 and bishop c5, the rest uh, will do without further commentary because we just traded rooks and won easily hope you enjoyed the speedrun guys and uh i will definitely put in a stream tomorrow thanks again for hanging out and uh thanks everybody for the raids see you later